Hello and welcome to All Saints Pauli's online. My name is Rob Graff and I serve as rector and I greet you all in the name of Jesus. It's Palm Sunday and we're in the old church. A few announcements as we prepare to step into worship together. Number one, I'm, I'm so proud of you. I hear wonderful things and I know it's not easy. So continue to reach out to one another, take care of one another, be the church. We're also asking for pictures, so send us some family pictures. Pictures of the family praying or playing. What does it look like in your home during this coronavirus time? We're gonna use those pictures online. We're reaching out to one another. You're getting phone calls from the church. You're getting phone calls from pastorate leaders. But I'm still encouraging you to reach out. If you have a need, let us know. You can reach out at info at allsaintspaulis.org or you can reach out to carol at allsaintspaulis.org. If you have a prayer concern, if you want someone to give you a call, we'll jump on it. We're continuing to pray the sevens. We're asking the Lord to throw this virus into the sea. And we're praying together at seven in the morning and seven in the evening, so make that a priority. We're so thankful that Bishop Steve Wood is doing so much better. He's off the ventilator and we hear that he improves every day. Thank you, Lord. As I said, it's Palm Sunday. So we begin our Holy Week journey together. We begin by welcoming Jesus into Jerusalem, proclaiming together, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We end our journey as we abandon Jesus to his cross. Would you pray with me? Come Holy Spirit, come in power as we meet at home, as we meet scattered. Would you be our center, be our song and our victory, be our joy. We offer you our fears, we offer you our doubts, and we look to you. Let your promises loom large and let your cross be ever visible. We pray all this expectantly in the precious life-giving name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship the Lord in song.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate, the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But the priests replied, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. And so they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field had been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel. And they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed me. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replied, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And then they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And the priests and the crowd together yelled, Barabbas. And Pilate replied, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all said, Let him be crucified. And Pilate replied, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and took the reed, and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his robe, and put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. Please stand. As they went out, they found a man, Cyrene, Simon by name, 
they compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink, mixed with gall, but when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he desires him, for he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out, again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, and they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. So these are crazy days. Our lives have been hijacked. People are dying and we want a cure. Anyone else scratching their heads about this hydroxychloroquine? Why won't they try it? Try anything, try the zinc, try the azithromycin, we'll try anything. Just give us a cure, give us an answer, bring us some relief. We know that the world's best is working on a cure for COVID-19, but it can't come soon enough. There's a spiritual correlation here. There's a spiritual virus that, that robs our soul and all of humanity is infected. Our very souls were hijacked years ago. So there, is another cry of the human heart, an even more urgent cry of the human heart on an even deeper level. Give us a cure, give us an answer, bring us some relief, we'll try anything. I'm of course speaking of our sin condition. Now stressful times can build character, but stressful times will always reveal character. So what are you seeing? How about we consider a cure? Pray with me. Lord, we do bow our heads and our hearts before you. We're uncomfortable. 
we're stressed, we're fearful. We don't know what the future holds. And we're looking to you to pour out faith. Lord, deliver us from looking to anything but you. Deliver us from looking to anything that the world has to offer. Fix our eyes on you. Fix our ears on your promises. Remind us of who you are and who we are because of it. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. You are familiar with this virus, our sin, and you're familiar with the symptoms. We feel isolated from God and estranged from one another. No matter how hard we try, we find we are slaves to self. We might know the difference between right and wrong, but we just can't do what's right. We are haunted by our addictions and our personal demons that destroy us from the inside out. We've tried to self-medicate. We've tried any number of fixes, but there seems to be no way we can save ourselves. And bottom line, we'll try anything. Here's the good news regarding our sin condition. The God of the universe has put his very best on the case, and he has come up with a cure. It's the most amazing medicine in the world, the most amazing medicine the world has ever seen. I'm talking about the cross of Christ, and it has a 100% success rate. I have a three-point advisory regarding this medicine, this cross of Christ. Number one, take your medicine and take it as prescribed. By this I mean let the cross be personal. It does you no good inside the medicine bottle. The cross is not a theory or a theology or a religious trick. The cross of Christ is an outstretched hand to a broken world, so let the cross be personal. From John 3, 16, you might know it by heart. For God so loved the world, put your name there, that he gave his only begotten son to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The cross is for you. If you had been the only person on the planet infected by sin, Jesus would have gone to the cross for you. This is a good time to mention some side effects. They are limited but severe. The only known side effect of the cross of Christ is death, a spiritual death, a complete and total dying to self. When we say yes to the cross of Christ, we are joining our Lord in his life and death and glorious resurrection. When we say yes to the cross of Christ, we become a new creation in Christ. The old has passed away. Become, behold, the new is come. As we die to self and we say yes to the cross of Christ, an exchange takes place. And here it gets very, very personal. Jesus takes all of our sin and all of our shame and we are given his righteousness. Paul says it best, speaking to the church in Corinth, this is from 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He, that is Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. The cross is for you. Take it as prescribed, make it personal. A second advisory, never add anything to this medicine. The cross of Christ is the final word, so let the cross of Christ be the final word. You might be wondering, what could I possibly add? So here's my short list. I try not to add my religious duties and devotions. I try not to add my spiritual masks. I try not to add my best efforts or any good works. Nothing could be added to what Jesus has done for us. And nothing could take anything away from what Jesus has won for us. The cross of Christ stands alone. In Matthew 27, 51, the passion narrative you just heard, as Jesus cried out from the cross and yielded up his spirit, we read that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. 
Now this curtain, this massive veil, some eight inches thick, was found at the center of the Jewish temple where it separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place. Only the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies and then only once a year on the great day of atonement. On this day of atonement or Yom Kippur, prayers would be said, blood would be sprinkled, and the sins of Israel would be covered for another year. Notice, when Jesus died for us on the cross, that veil was torn. Two things here. It was torn from top to bottom, and it was torn completely in two. Do you think the Lord was making a statement? Jesus will forever be our great high priest. And no longer will there be any separation from his holy presence. No wonder we read in John's account, just before Jesus took his last breath, he proclaimed, it is finished. Never add anything to your medicine. Let the cross be the final word. A third advisory don't change the label. Never pretend your medicine is anything but what it is. Sometimes we try to sanitize the cross of Christ, but when we sanitize our medicine, we run the risk of watering it down and making it something it is not. So let the cross be what it is. Let the cross be horrific. We wear crosses around our necks. We hang crosses on our walls but we must never forget what the cross is all about. During the first century, crucifixion was widely used. It was a method of execution so horrific that by AD 350, it was stopped. It was abolished because it was simply too cruel. The cross was more horrific than we can imagine. Cicero called it the most cruel and hideous of tortures. Here's how it happened. Jesus would have been stripped and tied to a whipping post. There he was flogged with a leather whip of perhaps five thongs interlaced with jagged bone and lead. Third century historian Eusebius put it this way. The sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles, sinews, and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. From here, Jesus was taken to the praetorium where he was mocked as the king of the Jews and a crown of thorns was crushed upon his head. Mocked, jeered, spit upon, struck in the head and face by a battalion of some 600 men. He was forced to carry a heavy wooden cross on his bleeding shoulders until one Simon of Cyrene was forced to carry it for him. When they reached the place of the skull, Jesus was stripped again and placed on the cross as it lay on the ground. Six inch nails were driven into his hands around the wrist. His knees were twisted together sideways so the ankles could be nailed to the post between the tibia and the Achilles tendon. He was lifted high as the vertical beam of the cross slid violently into the hole that had been pre-dug for this occasion. And here Jesus was left to hang, with unbearable thirst, exposed to all the elements, and encircled by the ridicule of a crowd. He hung in unbearable pain for six hours while his life slowly drained away. It has been called the height of pain and the depth of shame. The worst, however, was not the physical suffering or even the emotional pain of being rejected by the world and deserted by his friends, no. The worst was the spiritual pain of being separated from his heavenly Father. As Jesus took on all our shame, as Jesus became sin for us, we hear him cry, Eloi, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what it sounds like when he who knew no sin became sin for us, 
that we might become the righteousness of God. We are aware of our brokenness. This sin virus grips us. And we are even more aware of our inability to save ourselves. Our lives, our very souls have been hijacked. People are dying and we want a cure. Give us a cure. Give us an answer. Bring us some relief. And our Lord, the God of the universe, has done just that. He has given us his very best, his only son, to live the life that we could never live for ourselves, to die the death that we could never die, that we that believe in him should not perish but might have everlasting life. So we are to take, take our medicine as prescribed. It does us no good inside the medicine bottle. Let the cross be personal. We never try to add anything to our medicine. Let the cross be the final word. We must never remove the label. Don't pretend our medicine is anything but what it is. When we sanitize the cross, we make it out to be something it is not. I know that some of you listening right now have never tasted of this medicine. And your soul cries out for it. I'd like to lead you in a simple prayer, even now. It's as simple as giving your heart to the Lord. If you'd like to pray this prayer with me, if you'd like to take this holy medicine, simply bow your head and pray with me now. Oh God, I am hurting and hopeless. I know that I am a sinner and I cannot save myself. I cry out to you now in the name of Jesus who took on my sin and shame on the cross and died that I might have life. I may not understand this, but I believe that Jesus is your son and that he died and rose again. I ask him now to be the Lord of my life, my savior, my redeemer, and my friend. And I pray all this in his holy and life-giving name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer with me, would you take a moment to let us know? We want to come alongside you. We want to walk with you. We really are a family now. So you can email us at info at allsaintspaulies.org. Amen. And now let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Dear Heavenly Father, we know that there are many people sick and hurting and feeling alone. And we pray that, Lord, you will be with them and your healing touch will be active in their lives and their hearts. Lord, be with those people. Whisper and scream aloud that they are not alone and they are loved. Usher them into the presence of the living God. Lord, we pray for all those who right now are working on the front lines, nurses, doctors, anyone in these essential roles that are still serving. Lord, keep them safe. Keep them protected. Keep them encouraged in you. Dear Heavenly Father, continue to lead us and grow us closer to you. So that in this moment of great distress, that we will not turn to the broken patterns of the world, but we will turn to your way, your good, pleasing, and perfect will that offers us life and hope. And in the midst of this time, we pray for our leaders, our president, Donald, our governor, Henry. Lord, we pray that you will be with them, that you will guide them, that you will just bathe them in wisdom. And Lord, we pray that in every place for every elected official that you will use them to guide us back to you in a moment when we need you so fully. Dear Heavenly Father, as well today, we pray for all our priests and bishops, especially remembering Foley, our Archbishop, and Steve and David, our bishops, especially giving you praise today for the healing work 
that you are doing in Steve. We pray for our clergy here at this church. We pray for Rob, for Beth, for Thad, and for myself. Lord, give us vision. And in this strange time, find ways to use us for your purposes. Lord, we pray for our vestry here at All Saints and our staff and our pastorate leaders. Lord, it is for just a time as this that you have put them where you have. Use them to encourage the builders, to walk alongside hurting people. Lord, we pray too for St. Paul's Church in Greenville, South Carolina and its rector, T. Brown. Use them in that place. We also pray for Pearville and St. Barnabas Church in Low to Ray, Haiti. May they be a beacon of hope and light in this broken time. In our cycle of prayer for churches in our community, this Sunday we pray for the Reverend Buddy Phillips in St. Paul's Methodist Church. Lord, we pray that you will continue to walk alongside, use them, and build them up. In our cycle of prayer for churches in the Diocese of the Carolinas, we lift up Redeemer Church in Asheville, North Carolina, and its rector, the Reverend Gary Ball. And Lord, as we pray each Sunday for a foreign mission, for those who have been sent to the very ends of the earth, this week we pray for Matt and Katie Riley serving in France. Lord, give them favor. Give them opportunity to bear witness to the good news of your gospel. And as we pray before you today, as we come into your presence, Lord, we know that we do not come with clean hands. That this sin infection that we have heard about, that we have been exposed and that we're covered with it. And so, Lord, we enter into your presence, praying a prayer of confession. And I encourage everyone listening and watching along, either stand and take a posture of being present before the Lord, or if you may, kneel before the Lord right now. And let's pray this confession together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And now stand if you may. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. There is a prayer that's traditional for this Palm Sunday. It's also the colic for Monday and Holy Week, so it bridges us, it takes us into next week. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, whose most dear Son went not up to joy, but first he suffered pain and entered not into glory before he was crucified, mercifully grant that we walking in the way of the cross, may find it none other than the way of life and peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. One more song. Give his only son to me.
Thank you. 